日本史学習に最高にもってこいのサイト「サムライアーカイブスポッドキャスト」へようこそ美しい自然にあふれてる縄文時代から波乱万丈な幕末まで全時代を網羅して日本史の隅から隅まで一緒に語り合いましょうでは早速日本史の世界へレッツゴー Hey everybody, welcome back to the Samurai Archives podcast. This is Chris, and today we have part two of our discussion on 8th century Japanese military organization as stated in the Military Defense Statute of the Yoro Code. So enjoy part two and be sure to check out samuraipodcast.com for all your podcast needs. And if you're interested in supporting us, check out patreon.com slash samurai archives. All right, and with that, on with the show. Okay. All right. So, what I'm going to do now is kind of just go through documents in, in the, the order that I, that I translated them. So,、uh, the, the first one, how about why don't I do this? Why don't I read the English? And then we can kind of talk about each one. Sure. Okay. And I'll talk about kind of like, as I, like after I go through the English, I can, you know, like if there's particular like translation issues or whatever, then I can talk about that as well. All right. So, Article 1. Uh, commanders of units. Generally, the daiki, or the commander, of the gundan, the regiment, will command a thousand men. The shoki, executive officer, will accompany him, serving as his second in command. In general, a unit of a thousand men will have one daiki and two shoki. Units above 600 will have one daiki and one shoki. Units under 500 men will only have one daiki. Koi, or I call them battalion commanders, are assigned 200 men. Ryosui, company commanders, are assigned 100 men. Taisei, platoon commanders, are assigned 50 men. Okay, so that's Article 1. And some of the things we've already talked about, because we already talked about the daiki, the shoki, the, 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 the ryosui, and the,、um, so forth, the, the koi, and the taisei. But a couple issues that this That come up in this section. Number one is the issue of how do you translate pre modern military units and, and commanders、uh, or and, and, and positions, right? So, this is actually a, a point of contention that I bring out in the, the paper portion of this, where I disagree with the way that, that, that several people have interpreted these into English. Right. So, is this where you start calling out various scholars on their failed attempts? <laughs> yes.、Um, I wouldn't say failed attempts because that would be too harsh.、Um, but no, so the prevailing way to translate daiki in most of the secondary research I've seen in English is kernel, which on the surface makes sense because generally in a modern English speaking military force, A, if you're going to say Gundan is a regiment, then a colonel is generally the rank of the person who is commanding the regiment.、Um, I have a problem with this, though. I don't like doing this because what a daiki is is not a rank, it's a job, it's a, it's a position. And so you're drawing a false equivalency when you call this person the colonel. Their position is the commander of the gundan or commander of the regiment. So, just because somebody's a colonel does not mean that they're a regimental commander in a modern military, just like、um, back then. you know, Whereas, you know, if you call them the regimental commander, then that's what they're doing. That's their job. Like, that's a very specific designator. It's the same thing, at least according to this document. It's the same thing with a daiki. A daiki is somebody who is in charge of a gundan. It's not a rank, it's a position. So when you start flipping,、uh, you know, assigning labels to it that, that kind of cross those lines, I think it, it introduces a lot, of, a lot of misunderstanding and possible assumptions that somebody might make. They might assume that, oh, well, daiki is a rank in the Ritsuryo military structure,、uh, which it is not. So, people who were assigned as daiki had to be of a certain court rank, but that's their rank, not the fact that, that, that they have、uh, the title of daiki. So, this is one of those things, and, and I, so I talked about this at length in the paper. You know, I won't, I won't necessarily go to it, but, but that's one where I think if 
scholars don't necessarily have like uh, a lot of experience with the subject matter. Like in this case, you know, military organization. I, I've got a, a a little bit of experience with with that. Um, so they're not necessarily if they don't have that experience, they're not necessarily going to catch something like that and understand the the, the why that's imp an important difference. Uh, but if you were to just give this to somebody who's only familiar with modern military forces, right? and say, oh, well, it was commanded by a colonel, then there, the assumption is going to be that there's a military, a professionalized modern military rank structure at play here, and that is not the case. Um, so in order to keep that separate, I prefer to translate each of these as the commander, uh, as a duty position, right? So commander, or the shoki, I call him the executive officer, which is the second in command of a modern military unit, right? But it's not lieutenant colonel. If I call him lieutenant colonel, then that's making it, you know, adding assumptions that just should not be uh, made there, right? Um, and then, yeah, and, uh, and then all the all the way down. So um, all of these 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 are different position titles. So I translate them as position titles. Now the question could be asked, uh, well. If ranks are problematic in translation, why do you? Why is it okay to use the same unit names, right? So why why can I call the Gundan a regiment, and why can I call whatever it is the Ryosi is, is commanding a company, and why can I call a uh, the the Tai that the Taisei is commanding a platoon? Um, so that I mean, and that would be a good question to ask. The difference is there's no separate. A, uh, line of organization that's being confused here, uh, right? So like with ranks and job titles, you have a job title and you have a rank, and they often fit together in modern military armies. But um, for instance, you know, a colonel might be a regiment com regimental commander, but he might also do other things, or, or she uh, might also do other things in in the military. Uh, whether it's you know being on some general staff or or whatever, they don't get rid of they don't lose that rank of colonel when they go do another have another job. They're just not doing that particular job. So so there's a very strict you know uh, easily defined uh, difference between a job title and rank. With unit sizes, if you've got a a, a unit of a thousand men, um, it's generally like there's not like multiple things that you're going to call it just because they do different things, right? Um, you know, a regiment is a regiment, whether it's an infantry regiment, whether it's a cavalry regiment, whether it's an artillery regiment or whatever, it's, it's still a regiment. So there's not like, uh, you know, there, there's not another thing that I could call it that's of the equivalent side. Well, you know, I... You, you could go down a path of arguing brigades versus regiments, but that's not really relevant to what we're what we're discussing here. They're, they're, so so I'm comfortable, long story short, I'm comfortable with using with calling these things unit sizes that we use in modern military speak because we don't have other vocabulary to use, and it does accurately convey the this sense of, what size they are and where they fit in the hierarchical structure of other units, right? So if I had documentation that showed that the uh, tie of 50 people was not part of the uh, uh, the unit commanded by a Ryosui of 100 people, and so it didn't nest, then I wouldn't use company and platoon. Because by using company and platoon, I'm suggesting like implicitly that those those are nestable unit sizes that two platoons make up a company which make up a battalion which make up a um, uh, which make up a regiment right so if i had the sense that those that these units didn't mesh that way then i would not use those names all right so i'll go to the next section units Tigel. uh assign soldiers into units of 50 man platoons Tai, and five man teams, Kumi, and then together those are, are together a red Tai goal. Place those skilled with horse and bow into mounted units. Put the rest into infantry units. Junior officers up through the battalion level, or from Taisei to Koi, 
will command infantry and mounted unit tr um, and mounted troops separately. They shall not be mixed. Okay. So what's Article Two saying? It's now breaking down the platoon into five-man squads. So each platoon of, of 50 would have uh, 10 five-man teams. Uh, I'm sorry, not squads, teams of, of five, right? So then all of these are going to be assigned based on their skill with the horse and bow. Uh, so can they do mounted archery? Yes. Okay, you're going to, uh, you're going to a, a mounted uh, unit. If you can't, okay, you're stuck in the infantry. Um, and these are not mixed at anything uh, below the Gundan level, right? So Gundan may have both uh, uh, battalions in it that are infantry and that are mounted, but anything below the Gundan is either going to be one or the other. So that way that can, you can draw pretty clear lines of how things are organized and we have functional um, functional separation, which is interesting to me because that's very unique in a pre-modern military. At least in Japan, you don't we don't see this until the very later stages of the Sengoku period. In you know when I study in in my period, right? You don't have the separation, and even then, like oftentimes people like well you know, to, to, to bring up my favorite example, you know, people talking about Nagashino and, and the, the quote unquote cavalry. You'll notice I do not use the word cavalry because by using the word cavalry, it suggests an image that we think of, you know, Napoleonic cavalry units of, of all horsemen moving around on the battlefield, attacking, uh, and, uh, and, and pursuing the enemy and so forth. And even in the, the, the later Sengoku period, they're not separated out uh, like this, you'd have mounted samurai, but you'd also have, uh, you know, attendants on foot following with them. It was not simply a unit of, of people on horseback. So it's very interesting to me to read this and see that there's this clear separation between mounted archers and infantry. And here we are the, uh, the, in, in the 700s. Uh, so again, this is, it's a, it's a weird, uh, at least in the span of Japanese history, it's a very weird period of a, a very modern feeling military that um, just doesn't uh, uh, it doesn't continue. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm interested to get further into doing research and see how much of this legacy, if any of it, continues on into the earlier uh, periods of the Heian and so forth. Okay, so the third one uh, talks about the third article talks about recruitment. So as for the selection of soldiers to muster, uh, they should all be from the local area and divided into units. Do not assign them to different districts. Uh, as for the uh, selection of soldiers from inside the same home, take one man of every three. Okay, so this is you know how do we decide who to draft? They should all be drafted locally, which means that like you shouldn't draft people from Sagami province and send them up to serve in a gundan in, you know, Mutsu or uh, Echigo or something like that, right? They, they're they supposed to serve in the province that they're from, at least to be assigned to the unit from, from the one that they're from, right? And then who do we draft? Well, we draft, um, you know, young men, and from each household, take one uh, of every three, okay? So one third of the young male adult population, well, I'll get to the ages, it's not always young, uh, is eligible for military service. The other two members of a, a male members of, of a family, will, if we say they're three, then, you know, of course, are dedicated to uh, farming and providing taxes, if that makes sense. So then the next article, Article 4, uh, inspection of military equipment at the beginning of the winter uh, in the 10th month of each year. Provincial governors will inspect military equipment. So why this is interesting to me. Uh, why? Because uh, this is showing how not only that these, you know, these gundan are uh, underneath the responsibility of the provincial governor, but that the provincial governor is expected to take an active role in ensuring their readiness. This doesn't say, you know, the provincial office has to uh, make sure that they that these the the equipment's inspected. This says the provincial governor will inspect the military equipment. So that's kind of a big deal, right? 
Uh, okay, so Article 5 goes a little bit more into organization. So divide soldiers into groups of squads, or ka, of 10. Each squad is responsible for six pack horses. Feed and raise them for use as transport horses. If one should die, replace it quickly. Okay, so we've introduced this uh, Article 5 here introduces a new unit. So two, two kumi of five people each uh, put together as a squad. And so uh, some scholars think of this as an administrative organization. I, I'm inclined to think that there's not much difference between administrative and operational at this point. That's, that's much more of a uh, later sort of development uh, to, to say that, hey, we're, we're going to um, you know, have organization in non-combat situations one way, but in organization in combat situations in another way. I, that smacks too, of too modern a thing for me. So, so yeah, I think this is just two kumi put together. Um, the idea of it, the, the character used for ka for the squad is fire. And the idea there is that around a campfire, you're going to have 10 men. So two, two, uh, two teams uh, in, in a squad. So then this, this group of 10 is also responsible for providing uh, up to six uh, pack horses and caring for them. Uh, and these are used as transport horses, not just for the, the for the military's equipment, but they're actually responsible also for providing. Basically, it's a horse labor pool for the provincial governor to use. So these are where the pack horses come from for them to ship taxes uh, to the capital, and so forth. Um, so so basically, the military is being used as you know as ranchers for the for the horses uh, for the province. All right. Six, uh, soldier rations and equipment. All soldiers will prepare uh, six to, which is approximately uh, 10.8 liters of ration rice, and two sho, uh, 3.6 liters of salt, to be gathered together for the use of the squad. Uh, line up weapons and store them in the unit armory. If, while stored for a long period, equipment decays and becomes unusable, and must be replaced with good equipment by the soldier. Complete this exchange between the first day of the 11th month and no later than the 30th day of the 12th month. Every watch period, assign two men from those duties uh, as armory guards. On the day of mobilization, distribute the units to the unit by squad. So, logistics is often very boring for people, but I think this is this is actually pretty interesting. Um, and anybody who's been in uh, the military, has military experience, is going to find this very familiar. Not necessarily the having to bring food on your own, but but so that's what the first part of this is talking about is that each of these soldiers who's drafted. Uh, when they come for their military service, they have to bring, uh, you know, 10 liters of rice and and three and a half liters of salt, uh, and that gets put into the collective pot for their squad's use. Okay, and then they they have to also provide their own weapons. So one of the one of the things that a lot of scholars have said about this organizational structure is that it's designed to maximize the size of the army that you can build at while minimizing the cost which definitely when you're telling the soldiers that they have to bring their own equipment and pay for their own food yeah that definitely um uh it is is lower cost than than providing it all yourself out of out of taxation right so yeah so they bring all the equipment and then this 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 all gets put into the the armory or you know a common unit location that is then guarded so that people can't just break in and steal weapons or, or food or or, or, or or whatever. And I talk about this a little bit in the paper, but uh, you know when we keep in mind that this is the idea, uh, one of the ideas is this is that's going on right now in writing the Ruritsuryo codes at all, the Yoro code uh, among them, is state centralization, control of the state over every mechanism of of governance, right? So one of the one of these one of these things that they're they're gathering control of, um, bringing it under the state, is um, violence, military force. Um, and I mean, this thing about bringing their own weapons is actually, I mean, I don't know if I'm reading it wrong, but it, it, it strikes me as interesting. Yeah. Because, I mean, it reminds me of sort of, I know the word feudal is, is, pro, is complicated, but, you know, wait, wait, in later periods, warriors were expected to bring their own weapons. And right. then it was my understanding is that it was their weapons, and if they 
defected or if their um, their lord defected or his lord defected, then they took their weapons with them. And so right. it's kind of interesting that a consolidated national army would also um, expect people to bring their own weapons. Right. Well, I mean, that's and that's the thing, right, is like, is this because they're trying to minimize costs and so, you know, are they trying to minimize costs and, you know, is that the primary purpose or, or, or what is the purpose of that? I mean, I think that's the way to read it. And then there's also the element of, you know, this, the centralization. One of the things that they're trying to, to centralize control over is violence. So if, you know, soldiers are bringing their weapons and putting them in a central storage facility that's then kept under guard, then it's a lot harder for private citizens or, you know, soldiers when they're off duty or whatever to conduct violent acts. It's a lot harder for rebellions to take place because it's not, you know, some uh, regional uh, power broker who's, aren't, you know, gathering and arming people and able to then resist the government. It's, it's somebody, you know, like the, the, the means to do that are kept under uh, state control. Right. Um, now, I mean, as we know, like, I, I'm sorry for anybody who, you know, hasn't looked beyond the 700s in Japanese history, but spoiler alert, uh, this doesn't work very well. And they end up going back to it, it. It doesn't actually work as efficiently as they as they want. And I think a lot of this has to do with the limitations of ability to, you know, of a state to mobilize people in the 700s, at least in Japan. Um, and, you know, I can talk about that kind of in my general conclusions later. But it, it's still just reading through this, the whole text, um, and we won't, you know, obviously go through, through everything, but I mean, uh, I'll, I'll kind of go through the gloss a little bit after this, but some of this stuff was just so familiar to me as somebody who's, you know, w had a career in the military and dealt with the drudgery of day-to-day -day military service where, you know, we had an arms room, where we had an armorer. And it was, you know, we don't have guards on duty 24-7 today because we have sophisticated, you know, security systems and, and, and so forth. But, you know, all the weapons, like, people aren't taking their M4s or their M16s, you know, home at night with them, right? They're kept in an arms room, uh, at least in, in uh, you know, on a base in the States or something like that. Uh, and uh, they're kept under, 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 you know, electronic guard. Uh, so that, you know, you can't just walk in and check out a, a, a weapon and, and, and do something. Um, and, you know, where it says on the day of mobilization, distribute the units to the unit by or weapons to the unit by squad. Um, I mean, that's the same thing when it was time for us to go to the field or go to deployment or whatever, you'd go to the arms room and you'd have to sign your, uh, you know, the, the register saying that, yes, I've, I've taken my weapon, uh, and, and you get it issued to you and all, all your other equipment and, and then you go off. The same things. We won't go in detail with that part of it, but reading through the the the, the chapter and some of the the later worlds, it's very much procedurally the same sort of thing. Where uh, when they when, when they deployed to perform military service, they would go through. They would get their weapons just like this. They would get their their equipment. They would go do whatever deployment, and then they'd come back. And there was a the same sort of process where they had to turn in all their stuff, and if it was damaged. Um, then they had to pay for it, uh, or, or replace it. Uh, if they could show, if they, if they could prove that it was damaged because of, um, you know, because of a good reason, like the enemy did it or something, then, um, then they were excused. Uh, and, 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 but all these sorts of things. And it, it was just, it was very interesting reading through all that for me. Because I'm like, yeah, this is exactly the same sort of rules that I was, uh, you know, enforcing uh, as a commander, you know, in my own troops, I'm like signing supply sheets and, uh, you know, statements of charges for soldiers who had lost equipment and, and, and stuff like that. So another thing which strikes me is, so if they're all bringing their own equipment, I mean, that would suggest a lack of standardization, right? I mean, I'm yes. not sure. I'm not sure what to picture like just how variable the weaponry may have been but you know but it just means everybody's bringing their own weapon and uh, i don't know maybe the spear point is a little bit longer or a little bit shorter or right. uh, or whatever so first of all it's a lack of standardization in the sense of the army as a whole feels a little bit more um 
scattered, a little bit more disorganized mm -hmm. in that respect. Mm -hmm. But then also, I wonder if there's anything to be said about like if each person is getting. I, I'm not sure if we know this from the documents, whether each person is getting their own weapon back out of the armory or whether they're getting another weapon. But I wonder if you know, maybe people get sort of, I don't know, they get used to the the weight of, of their own, you know, haft. Right. As opposed right. to a different spear haft. Right. That's an interesting question that that from the I mean, this is a prescriptive document, right? This is like this is how you're going to do this. So the next step for that for that would be to go look at accounts of mobilization, which there aren't a whole lot of, to be to be quite honest, which is why really people really haven't uh, looked at the Rudy Studio Army in in a lot of detail. And and most scholars, at least before the last you know 15, 20 years or so, just considered it a failed you know, a, a failed experiment. And that's why they went back to, uh, you know, local um, privatized military forces that, you know, were the origins of the samurai. So I, I don't know. I'd have to do a lot more looking at uh, a, accounts of this time. But my sense is, and, and some later scholars uh, have suggested that it wasn't so much that, um, well, I mean, Carl Friday is really the person that I would recommend in Hired Swords to 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 read about this, and, it is, and I, I kind of agree with, with his assessment that it wasn't so much that this system failed as it was the nature of the need for military force changed. His specific theory being that because no outside threat materialized, they didn't need a large, cumbersome, infantry-based force uh, of military. What they needed was... Uh, more uh, mobile, so horseback, you know, a more a more mobile force for the pursuing of criminals. Uh, and he goes into great length in, in that book, uh, and also in um, Samurai Warfare and, and, and the State, you know, one of his other books, talking about how that that develops and moves uh, away, and that that this is the reason why this sort of military that we we find in the Yoro Code goes away is because the needs shift. So I don't know, but the, the, the issue of standardization on that, let me read the next one, which is about what they were told to bring. And then, right. and then we can talk about that a little bit. Okay. So this is a bit of a long one. So listeners bear, bear with me, but okay. So equipment and, and weapons. Soldiers will maintain for every squad, one blue cloth curtain that opens in the back Two each copper bowls and small pots, one hoe, one grinding mortar, one axe, one hatchet, one chisel, two sickles, one set of shears. For every 50 soldiers, so for every tie, uh, one fire starter, which be hard to, to, to picture in an audio format here, but I found a picture of one in um, one of the, the dictionaries uh, that I have. But it's, if, it's like if you look at any, or if you go back and watch like old Western movies and they have like a, you know, a Native American uh, building a campfire and they use like a bow uh, with like a stick and some sort of, uh, like they use the bow and that turns the stick and the, which, which uh, causes friction and like the kindling and starts a fire. It's, a contraption that looks somewhat like that. I didn't know what else to call it besides a fire starter. Makes sense though. Yeah. Seems easy to picture. Right. So so that's kind of what it looks like. Okay. So one fire starter, one pound, and this is again for every fifty soldiers. They have to have one of these. One pound of dried kindling grass, one hand saw, and then for every soldier, one bow, one bowstring case, one spare bowstring, fifty military grade arrows. One quiver, one long sword, one short sword, one whetstone, one rush cap, and by that I mean if you think about like conical uh, straw hats that we you know see often depicted, and in, 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 that's what they're talking about. Uh, one rice bag, one water bucket, one salt container, one set of leggings, one pair of straw sandals. Uh, apparently, you know shirts and uh, uh, undergarments are, are not required. Uh, soldiers are responsible for providing all of these items personally. They must not be lacking even a little. On the day of mobilization, all of these things must be brought by each soldier. If it is the year of assigned duty, every man must have his own equipment, 
and must not borrow from someone else. So <laughs> the list is interesting, but I, I find the last part of that the most interesting that um, because the way that duty was assigned is, is so one person out of every three ma- adult males in the household was assigned uh, to duty or was assigned as a soldier, but they, that didn't mean that they were always on duty. They would be registered with the Gundam and then would be sent home uh, and then called up for periodic portions of service. And I, I don't think I actually get into that um, in in the full translations that I did. But what this is saying is, a, and, and what you'll find in, I mean, it's just like laws, it's just like rules in the military that we have now, the, you know, this, you'll, you'll find the funniest things, but the reason that there's a rule or a law is because somebody has done something that causes you to, to have it, right? So what this is telling me is that at some point it was common practice or common enough that people were just, you know, maintaining one set of equipment and then handing it off to the next guy when their turn of duty was over. And that, that explains it. There you go. Right. I see. And so since the idea was, okay, we're going to have, you know, a set number of people on duty at any time, but the, but, but what we want is a trained force. So like, this is a national guard, right? Like you're going to go do your two weeks of guard duty, but then you're going to go back and work in the fields, but you have to be ready for when we call you up, when the Tong invade or whatever. Right. So everybody has to have their own helmet, you know, weapons, whatever, right? If you're just if you've got three people sharing one and just switching off because oh well now it's your duty, so you take the sword and the the bow strings and the bow and the arrows and stuff, then when they there's a national crisis and they call everybody up, you've got three soldiers with only one set of equipment. So <laughs> It, it just it just strikes me as 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 amusing um and and I, there's a continuity there with problems that we have today because you know soldiers today are all going to try to 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 minimize the 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 effort that they have to give uh and you know hey oh yeah no oh you can't find your helmet we'll just take mine it's fine um so you know obviously these peasants who have been recruited are you know were or were tempted to be like well out of our family, we got three people who are eligible for military service and have to go do their guard duty time. But, you know, why should we have three sets of bows? Because bows are expensive. Swords are expensive. Uh, we'll just rotate off. And this is this is making very clear that that is not allowed. Okay, so number nine, training. Soldiers must be trained in the use of the Oyumi. Additionally, use it on campaign. Normal bows cannot compare to its effectiveness. So the Oyumi, uh, and I go by Friday's explanation of it in um, Hired Swords, is translates as various in various ways as to like some sort of large crossbow. So I imagine it that it's some sort of large crew served projectile weapon, and we'll see why in the next in the next statement. But that uh, that there's this this large if you if you kind of think of it imagine it like a ballista or something like that that's probably somewhere in the right area so then the next one for uh article 10 for each tie in the gundan okay so for each 50 man unit in the in the regiment select two able-bodied soldiers and assign them as all yumi operators give them equal duties and include them in the watch so what this is is you've got so so everybody has to train on how to use it, but then you assign two people, two specifically uh, trained and able-bodied people, uh, you know, of strong body, as permanent crew for this weapon. That's how important this weapon was perceived. Uh, that there's you know these two legal you know articles that address this specifically. So is an Oyumi something different than just a longbow? Uh, yes, it's it's a so it's difficult because apparently this term has been used in different ways at different times. Uh, Friday describes it as a uh, a large. Um, so almost like a crossbow type 
interesting. Like a, a crew operated crossbow. So like I said, if you, if you picture a, a ballista, which is one of the big like siege weapons, it may not be quite, uh, but it's, it's basically like this big crossbow used as a siege weapon. If, if it's, if you picture something like that, I don't know if it's quite to that size. There's been, I saw, it may have been in Friday. It may have been somewhere else where, where, uh, there were suggestions that it was, it shot multiple arrows uh, so it may, may instead have been shooting one big arrow, maybe it shot multiple arrows, but this was used, this was, these were, um, assigned per Gundan, right? Uh, or I'm sorry, one of these was assigned per tie, so they had one per every 50, uh, soldiers, right? So this was a, a kind of a big deal. Um, Friday talks about it and he says he, it's, it's not really clear why this goes away, but apparently the training wasn't being done. So uh, if, if you read his account of it in Hired Swords, he says that by the time you get into like the early hand period, there's people like they're supposed, they're assigned these weapons, but nobody knows how to use them because nobody's been going and doing training on, on how to operate these things. And so his, his theory is that these go by the wayside and nobody uses them anymore because they just never kept up with the training. I don't, I don't really know how I feel about that. Um, because I, I, it, it seems like if you've got like that, it seems, that seems counterintuitive to me. If you've got this weapon that's so powerful that you've got laws being written on how to use it, then, um, it's probably the case that, that it was just too complicated to maintain. Um, yeah, too hard to build or too hard to keep an operation. Right, maybe yeah. to keep an operation. Yeah. I'm thinking that the maintenance was too difficult. Um, now, if you subscribe to his theory that the nature of, of warfare and combat changed and it, it was more geared towards, you know, small units of mounted troops chasing after each other for the apprehension of criminals or something like that. Well, you know, obviously you're not going to bring out a large crew served weapon uh, like the Oyumi to do something like that. So I could certainly see how if that's <clears throat> if that's really the way things went, then the this falls out of use and well if you're never using it like i mean it's human nature if there, you've got a piece of equipment that you never use then then you you, you tend to ignore it and well why are you going to train on that you never use it um i'm i'm certainly there's a a there was a particular computer system that when i was a uh battalion intelligence officer uh we were supposed to use uh and i told my soldiers that uh, and this was when i was in korea if um, if we ever actually went to war, because we were going to be moving so fast, we were never going to be in a place to set it up. Um, I actually gave instructions to, you know, use a grenade and blow it up, uh, and <laughs> dump it off the back of our, uh, back, back of our vehicle, because, you know, it just, it was, all it was doing was taking up space and, and slowing us down. So I can kind of relate on yeah, that, so. that sense. Anyway. Yeah, as for the, yeah, my, I guess my brain didn't make the connection with Ballista and oh, you mean, I, for some reason I went to like big bow and then I, and then I realized like, wait, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, you know, it, that's literally what the, the characters mean. But I, if you think of like a, I mean, a crossbow is a type of bow, right? Um, or Ballista is actually, a, it's just a really large bow. So that makes sense to me. But again, this is so poorly documented that even Friday is kind of like, well, I think this is what it is, but who knows? Um, so, yeah. Um, all right. So the next uh, section is thir that I translate as 13, or next article, selection of Gundan officers. Okay, so we talked about it a little bit before. As for the selection of Daiki and Shulki, select those of merit, uh, which means those of court rank. Uh, or commoners, those without court rank, who demonstrate skill in the military arts from those within the ministry, and I'm hypothesizing that this is the Mil Ministry of Military Affairs, okay, so the Kyobushal, who were of sixth rank and below, but without assignments. So again, this kind of goes into the whole rank versus versus uh, position thing. These are people who, who already have, you know, court rank of the sixth rank or below, but they're just, they don't have a position, they don't have a job, so... We can, we can use them to fill these jobs. Uh, select officers from Koyu and below from among the commoners who show great skill with the horse and bow. 
select Shucho, uh, which is a uh, administrative officer. So this is this is likely I'm hypothesizing the person who is in charge of maintaining uh, personnel and logistics rosters from those who show great skill with writing and arithmetic. So again, you know, just kind of like the same what we were talking about before with the the, the structure. Um, I find it really interesting that they have this uh, the um, the shucho the the administrative officer uh, because again it's it's showing that there's like state administration you know like they you have to keep records you have we have to know who's on our rosters we have to know how much equipment we have uh, somebody has to has to count it when it comes back from the field and and, and so on um, and then the last one that I, I translated here uh, is about the assignment of commanding officers to campaign armies when dispatching generals to camp command campaigns for forces of 10,000 soldiers there will be one commanding general shogun Okay, and this is the same shogun that we, we eventually um, associate later with National Military Command. Uh, two vice commanding generals, or fuku shogun. Two military directors, gunken, chiefs of staff, uh, is what I'm hypothesizing that to be. Uh, four sergeants major, gun sol, and four administrative officers, rokuji. For forces from 5,000 to 10,000, subtract one vice commanding general, one military director, and two administrative officers. Uh, for forces from 3,000 to 5,000, subtract two of the sergeants major. Each of these is one army. For three armies combined, or what we would term a, a core today, uh, a field marshal, Tai Shogun, is appointed command. So, you know, this is when when they mobilized the Gundan to go uh, on campaign. It would be they would be combined together with other Gundan from other provinces. Uh, into this army, and this is the the kind of command structure that they followed. So, and then you know, I have some notes there that that talk about um, that, but we don't need to go into that. I don't think. All right, so that's the basic text that I translated. Uh, so uh, the, the portions out of it, and then for the rest of them. I, trans I, I, I basically summarized, gave a summary of them. So, um, all right, so going through and spending the time translating and, and reading through the code like I did gave me some, some, some insights and, and some observations that I hadn't quite grasped beforehand. Uh, number one was just about the, the, how elaborate the command structure was. Uh, for these these Uritsuryo armies, you know, it was in, in intended to kind of centralize power, um, and and while there were still local elites who were incorporated into the the structure of the Uritsuryo army, they that's the thing they were incorporated into it. They were given central appointments as either daiki or or other uh, positions, so it co-opted them into you know, this, this nationalized command structure. I was also very struck by the, uh, the level of record keeping, uh, and orders. Like we, we talked a little bit about it, but like, um, like I said, you know, even when they came back from campaign, they had, um, all sorts of detailed lists of things that they had to do when they came back and, uh, you know, to account for equipment and account for personnel and before they would release, uh, soldiers back to their homes and, and, and so forth. You know, and it was very similar to the things that, uh, that, that that modern military units do to account for equipment and personnel when they come back from deployment. However, there there are some some key differences, though. You know, it is uh, some of the advantages that several scholars have pointed out about this this system uh, were that it was uh, low cost, and actually this is um, F William Maine Ferris calls it low cost that it limited the campaign season because it uh, uh, relied on agricultural uh, labor uh, to fill the, the soldier ranks. So, you know, they could only campaign uh, outside of the cultivating season. Otherwise, you wouldn't have any food. Defensive nature and the limited role of, of local elites. I'd really say that only the low cost was an advantage, but, you know, where, like we talked about, the soldiers had to pay for their own weapons. However, you know, they and and... We, we t let's talk about that for a little little bit. Why do they? I mean, they did have to pay for their own weapons, but that um, 
the flip side was that this is a form of taxation service, right? So what's going on? Why are, uh, why are they, you know, why would soldiers have to pay for their own weapons? Well, in return for bringing their own equipment and then performing service, they're not being taxed in other ways. Every village had to provide both tax in the form of payments of goods. So we normally think of rice, but at this time it's also cloth is is often the unit of, of taxation. And then they also had to provide uh, labor service. So for instance, if the government decided to that they wanted to build a road or whatever, um, then they had to do this. Well, this counts as the the labor service for the for the soldiers and their families, right? So they're excused from these other taxes because they're performing uh, military service for the state. So that's the trade-off there, if that if that helps make sense. Um, so you know, so yeah, so it's low cost because you're you know this is their 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 taxation service. But that also means that they had to have, be able to provide those those resources personally, um, in order to, you know, in order to participate, right? Uh, which then puts a drain on, and and this is another way that it limits the uh, ability to campaign because not only are you limited based on the agricultural cycle, but you know the longer you campaign, the more your soldiers are having to pay personally out of pocket or or it's costing them the ability to go and provide for their families in other ways. Um, so it, it, it puts a real drain on uh, your service. So on that, you know, I, it got me thinking about the nature of national quote unquote military service, right? And just thinking in a large scale of military history, uh, where, where do we see these sorts of things successfully? Well, it's usually, and I, I don't, I don't want to go quite down the road of, you know, Victor Davis Hanson or somebody like that, but, but we do see like a a a state can mobilize a large percentage of its po uh, commoner population for military service like this when it either is a coercive enough that it, you know, can can force. This and that's something I think we see in many periods in China, uh, where they can raise large armies because they have the the state structures to do so, um, or where you get buy-in from the population itself, right? And that we really don't see until um, you know outside of the Roman Republic, we we really don't see that until on a, on a grand scale until the the period uh you know of enlightenment and revolutionary wars uh in the united states and france um well that create the united states uh and then in france and then the pinnacle of that being napoleon's uh, grand armee in uh, france in the early 19th century uh where the the army is made up of citizens right, who are, you know, not only serving in the military because somebody above them is going to beat them with a stick if they don't, uh, or, or cut off their head, but because they have, uh, you know, bought in mentally and emotionally to the idea of the state and, and that they feel, you know, part of that, right? So nationalism is involved and, and, and so forth. So, I think that's one of the things that we should look at it, or, or, you know, keep in mind when we look at whether or not uh, this uh, Ritudio state military was a success or a failure was, could it really, uh, really accomplish the things that it, that it set out to do according to the codes without some sort of mechanism for motivating the lower classes? So either positive or, or negative reinforcement by simply being, you know, so strong that they can um, force everybody to do, uh, you know, to to follow the 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 dictates that they have set out in the legal codes for military service. So, um, I think that's something that I might, you know, be interested in exploring at some point is is that relationship between the state and what today we would call the citizen. I guess what then you would call the subject, and the success of a a a state formation like this or in a military uh, 
uh, the formation of the military like this. What we find as we as you move later, and this kind of crumbles and is replaced by the sort of military structure based on personal bonds of personal loyalty that both Ferris and Friday uh, discuss in their books, is that you know that's those uh, warriors are motivated, whether it's by personal reward or personal loyalty to um, some sort of local leader, but they're they're motivated to serve for those people, right? Um, so what I don't get out of this is a real good sense of why is anybody motivated to do this? This is if it's just another form of taxation, um, then uh, I can see a lot of you know, hey, we're only going to have one set of 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 weapons and equipment for the three of us because why do we want to spend all our money? Uh, on this when we're not, you know, we don't feel that we're part of, of that. So I thought that was, I, I thought that was interesting to think about. Maybe only me. But, and then so I guess going forward, I mean, there's a couple different ways that I could do something with this. I mean, this was, you know, a, a paper and a project for, uh, for a class, but, you know, I may return to it in the future. I mean, number one, nobody's done a, um, a full English language translation of uh, the Yodo code period. So, uh, you know, I don't know that I'd want to do the whole Yodo code. That would, that would probably take my entire career, <laughs> but I could certainly see possibly trying to translate the, you know, all 75 of the articles and using that uh, to then, you know, look at the nature, at least the, uh, the way that military service was conceived on paper, uh, as it were. So then, uh, so that's, that's one possibility. And then, and then turning that into kind of a research, some research that's in conversation with, uh, the stuff done by Friday and Ferris on the topic. Uh, but kind of looking at it from a slightly different angle, uh, as I've kind of already talked about here. And then, the last thing is I, I talked with um, – I may have mentioned this earlier before. I'm not sure. But um, I talked with uh, a, f a friend of mine who's a scholar of Tang China, uh, and he was saying that there was that there's nobody in who in English has done a comparison of the Tang codes versus the um, Japanese codes uh, with specific respect to how the military was organized. Um, so I think that would be an interesting joint project with somebody who was – familiar with the Chinese side of things or, or maybe as a group collaboration to to do a comparison because there's obviously similarities, but there's also some very distinct differences. Uh, so I think not only could we get some insight into both the Tang and the, the, the Japanese systems, but also why are there like why did they make the changes that they did? If we can kind of think about that and conceptualize that, then that's going to give us some interesting insights into how they, how the Japanese uh, at this time perceived uh, their military and their problems, uh, you know, and then and then used kind of like the Tang as a base to adjust off of. So I think that's two, you know, a, a few interesting possibilities of where I might take this in the future. But who knows? Uh, we'll see. All right, and that's it for another episode of the Samurai Archives podcast. As usual, we'll have another episode out to you in around a month or so. In the meantime, check out all your podcast needs at samuraipodcast.com. And thanks again to our Patreon supporters. And if you would like to support the podcast along with them and get your hands on some bonus audio and other things, check out patreon.com slash samuraiarchives. All right, and that's it for this episode.